<laughs> Amen. Well, we've been having such a great time. And uh, once again, thank each and every single one of you for your sacrifice, dedication to be a part of this summit. This, this is the last session here. And I will be brief with you, but what I want to do is just um, uh, challenge uh, you and, and, and I, not only as individuals, but yet as congregations, because we have our, our churches represented here this morning, and, and those um, disciples and, and leaders, etc., who have uh, made time to be here on Saturday, uh, you're the ones that are going to go back to your congregations and inspire the rest of the folks. You're the ones that are going to go back uh, and bring to them what it is that you've learned, what it is that you've heard, seen, and uh, begin to implement that, not only as the pastors, but as leaders, begin to challenge the rest of the folks. So what I want to do, I know we've been challenged to reach our potential this week as Christians, as individuals, and whatever that, would, whatever that means for you, whatever that, that uh, aspect of your own personal life means you need to do, as we've heard so eloquently this week, then that's what needs to happen. But what I want to do this morning as I close out this summit is I want to look at reaching our potential as a fellowship. What does that mean? What is that going to take as a, a group of churches? What it means is that in order for that to take place, that we are going to reach our potential as a fellowship, then there's going to need to be an authorization, an authorization to this generation and to the next generation to pass on what they've seen and what they have heard and learned. Because without that, we'll never grow. Without, without that concept of authorization taking place to new leaders and new ministry workers, we'll never reach our potential as a fellowship because the fact is, is that church growth happens through leadership. That's the way churches grow. And as we develop leadership in our churches, what we're doing is we're authorizing those individuals to take what they've learned and to teach it to someone else. So it's our responsibility as Christian leaders, those of us who are leaders in ministry, us as pastors, that it's up to us to make sure that uh, we don't uh, let that principle fall by the wayside, that principle of authorization that's so, so important. When we authorize the next generation to carry on the gospel, and that's my sermon title this morning, simply authorize. Not, not hard to forget. Say that with me, authorize. Authorize. You know what that means? Some of you have given authorization uh, to, to your, your kids that they have permission to do certain things. They have the authority to, to, to be certain places because you have authorized them. You've given them that, that ability. The, the simple definition of author, authorize simply means to give official authority or power to someone to commission. And so uh, when we understand that concept of authorize, that is critical for our fellowship to, to reach that, the potential and uh, to, to accomplish whatever God has for us. Now, Jesus understood this in the Gospel of Matthew, the Great Commission, chapter 28. We all know it, and we've all read it so and heard it so many times. And uh, here's going to be another time in uh, verse 19 and 20. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He's been authorized. By whom? His Father. God the Father gave him power, commissioned him official authority. He says, therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even 
to the end of the age. And so what Jesus was doing was authorizing his disciples uh, to uh, take the message that they've heard and to pass that on to others uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples. Jesus understood as he gave the disciples the authority, as he authorized them to continue the work proclaiming the good news uh, of God's love, God's grace, and, and God's mercy upon humanity, that that was going to cause something to grow, to multiply. He understood in order for the church to reach its potential, they needed to multiply leaders. John Maxwell said this is a quote, the best leaders lead today with tomorrow in mind. And they do that by making sure they invest in those who will carry the legacy forward. That's what we've been challenged to do this week as, as Christians, to reach our potential, to, to let development take place in our life, to mature whatever that means to you. But yet, it goes beyond that because once we, we, we as Christians begin to grow, as leaders begin to grow, we need to start uh, uh, passing that on to others who, as Pastor Sergio preached, uh, maybe have one talent, maybe they have two talents or three talents. Authorize them to grow, give them understanding, spend time with them to try to achieve a greater uh, 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 role in their life uh, as a Christian. And so, as John Maxwell said, as Jesus spoke to the disciples, and so you and I have been commissioned to do that very same thing, the goal of leadership is to make ourselves replaceable. Jesus replaced himself with who? The 12. And so what we need to do is to, as leaders and pastors, is uh, make ourselves replaceable in our churches, in our ministries. That's exactly what Jesus did. That's what he expects us to do. Now, that doesn't make some of you folks very happy because I like what I'm doing. I like being in charge. I like, I like doing what I'm doing here. But yet, we need to be honest with ourselves as uh, you know, I've learned uh, time really flies by quickly. And what we need to learn is that uh, there are different seasons in life as, uh, in, as, as there is in, in ministry. And what we need to do is develop leaders, develop people under us to begin to take the place where we are so we can move on to other things. We begin to, to, to move on to maybe uh, as a leader you have, as, and I refer to Pastor Serge's message because it was so timely and great line up with mine, that maybe someone you're working with has two talents where your job is to develop them to go to, for three talents, four talents, five, whatever the case might be. That means that when they do that, now you can move on to another area of ministry. Maybe you'll be ten talents. Maybe you'll go on and uh, do something greater than where you are now. But you'll never know that. You'll never reach your potential. Our congregations will never reach their potential unless we develop the leadership that we're supposed to do. And so uh, someone said succession is one of the key responsibility of uh, leadership. Jesus, again, authorized the 120 in the upper room with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1. And in verse 7 and 8, Jesus said, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates, times, uh, that, and they are not for you to know. Asking about when uh, the kingdom is going to be restored. But this is what Jesus says. But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was authorizing uh, the 120 to go out into the highways and the byways, evangelize and tell people about the kingdom of God. It wasn't to be kept 
within just the 12, but it went from the 12 to the 120. That's how multiplication takes place, pastor, in your church. It's when you begin to multiply leadership and give them authority. A lot of times, uh, as leaders, we are reluctant to hand off authority. And I understand it needs to be done slowly and with wisdom. There are never any guarantees, but that should not matter. We have to do that. And we have to rise people up to the next level and let God do whatever needs to be done. I remember uh, we had a pastor come one time and um, he had a, a big church, a large, large church, and he came and ministered at one of our conferences, and we were in my office, and we were talking, and he understood we were a, a discipleship-making ministry and that we planted churches. And so we were talking and having a conversation, and he said, let me just ask you a question, because he didn't have any churches out. He said, doesn't it bother you when you, you invest in someone and, and you raise them up in leadership, etc., and so on, and then you send them out to pastor, and then they, they, they just go away? And take it. Doesn't that, how can you deal with that? And I told him, I looked at him, I said, you know what? Yeah, it bothers and it hurts, but yet, that's what we're called to do. In spite of what the outcome might be, our job is to do what we've been uh, commissioned and authorized to do, and the rest is in God's hands. That's the way it needs to work. And so many times as leaders, we're skeptical, but what if it doesn't work? And what if this happens? Well, that's God's business. That's God's business. Our business is to be obedient to the Word of God, which says, go out and uh, multiply yourself. That's what we need to do. Jesus understood that. The Apostle Paul understood that. He authorized Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, the first two verses, Paul writes, and he says, You therefore, my son, be strong, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What, what Paul was saying to Timothy is, listen, Timothy, I'm authorizing you to do what I am doing, what I have done. I need for you to, to start developing. And uh, as you do develop, you start developing other people. You see, we read these scriptures all the time. We hear them all the time. But do we really take them seriously as a, a critical aspect to what God expects from us? Or we just look at it as, well, yeah, that's what the Bible, Bible says. And so, you know, this is something that uh, needs to happen. It's imperative. It's critical that we get a hold of this concept of authorizing and uh, uh, raising up men and giving them the authority to be able to make some decisions and to be able to move on to the place God wants them to be in. God authorized Moses. We know that in the Word of God. As the leader of his people, to lead them out of slavery in Egypt uh, and to bring them, lead them into the promised land. And we know that uh, Moses Moses's uh, mandate ended there uh, on that mount where he was uh, uh, looking out and God spoke to him and he spoke with Joshua and, and said, it's not for me to go there. You are going to lead them. What he was doing was he was authorizing Joshua to continue the work, to assist him. He invested his life in Joshua. And as he neared the end of his life, uh, he appointed and authorized Joshua to continue the work. It is critical this morning that as leaders, as ministry leaders, as pastors, we grasp that understanding that authorization cannot stop. It has to continue on in order for the work of God to grow and uh, to reach its full potential. It is not an option. 
We are called to authorize the next generation of uh, ministry people uh, to grow into their leadership positions. I love it when I see young people in ministry. I love it when I see young people moving around and doing this and doing that. Why? Because they're learning and they're being prepared uh, and they're learning the understanding of responsibility and uh, the, the, the responsibility that's been given to them, the limited, maybe, authority, it, and it comes in stages. It, it comes in levels of authorizing them to, to do certain things, to be responsible for certain things like we do with our children. You know, we, we give them levels of authority. We give them levels of responsibility. We don't just give them everything at one, at one here. Here's the key to the car. It's your car now, and you make the payments. You know, here are the keys to the house. It's your house now, and you, you take care of it. No, as Pastor Sergio says, we teach them how to cut the grass, throw out the trash, clean the rooms, do whatever, or bathe themselves and do, do that kind of stuff. And it's by level by level. But yet we don't stop doing that, do we? We continue that in the church. It is critical that we authorize this next generation and bring them to that place if we are going to reach our full potential as a fellowship. The failure to authorize brings uh, devastating consequences. We know that, as I mentioned, Moses authorized Joshua, and Joshua brought, led the people into uh, God's promises for their, their, their lives. He kept them on track spiritually. He constantly reminded them concerning the Word of God, the agreement, the covenants, the promises of God, and he kept that at the forefront of their understanding. But something happened. There was something that was missed. We read about it in the book of Judges in chapter 2. Apparently, somewhere along the line, there was a failure. There was something, a, a breakdown in communication. And it seems that Joshua failed to authorize new leaders to continue the work uh, after he passed away. We read about that in Judges chapter 2 and in verse 8. It says, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. So Joshua's generation passed away. Then it goes on and says, And then there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal, false gods. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. See, that's exactly what happens when you fail to bring authorization to the new generation, the next generation. Fail to teach them about what God has done in our lives. Fail to teach them the principles of God's authority, uh, leadership, guidance, the importance of following only God in Him only. And what took place is that Israel was in the midst of other people who were idol worshipers. They, were, they, they knew not God, and they succumbed to those gods that other people were worshiping, and it angered the Lord. I want to tell you, it, it, it doesn't please God when we fail to do what we're supposed to do. It doesn't please God when we as leaders, as pastors, do not take the step of, of, of making sure that we pass on what we know, what we pass on, uh, what we've, we, we've received, and do that with, with uh, diligence, and, we, and do that with wisdom. And here we find that somewhere along the line, there was a breakdown in the authorizing of new leaders for that generation, and didn't happen, and they were... They were lost. 
When we follow the principles of equipping, and that's basically what it is, discipleship. And it seems we've come to a place in the church world where discipleship over the years has kind of lost its importance. It's lost uh, its, its real meaning of what, what's supposed to happen. We have to prepare the next generation and give them the authority. That's what authorizing is. Give them the authority to lead future generations into the blessings and the promises of God. And so... What we've been authorized with, what we've been given, and what we need to give uh, to the next generation of young leaders is teaching them how to guard the standard, how to guard the truth of God's word in their lives, because that's critical. That's what Joshua didn't do. That's why they went and started worshiping whatever was com whatever was convenient. Whatever everybody else was doing, we're going to do that. Because they had no understanding of uh, what they were supposed to be doing. The Apostle Paul picks up on this thought in 2 Timothy in chapter 1. And he tells Timothy, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, guard. Would you say that word with me? Guard. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. I don't know, but I, as, I, as I look at, at, at Moses and Joshua and reading in the Old Testament, somewhere along the line in Moses' and Joshua's generation, they stopped treasuring the word of God. They stop looking at God's word as being valuable. That's what that word treasure means. Some of you have treasures. Your wife is your treasure, husband. Uh-oh, time for a marriage seminar? <laughs> Sounds like it to me. I said, your wife is your treasure, husband. <laughs> Don't expect lunch, okay? That's done. You make your own sandwich. You see, somewhere along the line, they fail to guard the standard of God's word and treasure the word of God. And Timothy, and Paul tells Timothy, this is what you need to do, retain. In other words, hold on to it. When you retain something, it means you keep it. Keep the standard of sound words that you've heard. Don't, don't give it away. Don't lose it. Don't put it somewhere else. Keep it in your heart and guard it because it's been entrusted to you. Young people, if you're listening here today, if you're here, wherever you might be, what we have as older Christians, as seasoned Christians, and we've been trying to give to you is a treasure. It's not a lot of rules and regulations. It is a treasure. Value it. Value it. Treasure it. Guard it. Don't hold it loosely. Because if you do, you'll end up like Joshua's generation as they passed away. The other generation following them didn't know what to do, didn't know what to value anymore. Young Christians are commanded to retain the standard and guard the good deposits. Not authorized to change it, make it what you want it to be, but keep it the way you were given it. Don't change it. You know, for 45 years, New Harvest Christian Fellowship has not changed. We are New Harvest Christian Fellowship, disciple-making uh, ministry. We want to send out churches. Uh, we hold to the Word of God. Uh, we do not uh, uh, sway or move what's been entrusted to us. We guard the treasure. Young people, that's what you need to do. You hold on to it with everything you've got. The leadership skills that you've seen is, are so critical that you 
retain those and that you value them. That's why I love uh, the Royal Rangers, that they're training young men to become leaders. That's why I love uh, impact, Sister Kathy. Pastor Sergio doesn't like impact. I, I like it. Are you listening, Pastor Sergio? I just learned, I, I mean, I just started training myself because I always said missionettes, missionettes, and I got in trouble. So I had to learn to say impact. You see, it's so important that we learn to authorize those young people, the next generation, to have that courage that only comes by the Holy Spirit in spite of opposition, in spite of what is or not popular, that we hold to the standard uh, that you've been given uh, and you guard it with all of your heart, whether it's popular or not. And so that means we as leaders need to train them and teach them and lead them uh, to take that torch uh, of Christian leadership passed on to them, hold it dear, and prepare someone else to do the same. That, that's discipleship. That's what it's all about. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes again to young Timothy in verse 6. And he says, For this reason, I remind you. How many know young people need to be reminded? Yes. <laughs> I mean, and they're only nine. And they're only ten. And there may be 15 and 20. But you still got to remind them to do what? Brush your teeth. Comb your hair. Wash your face. Do this and do the other. They have to be reminded. And so Paul is telling Timothy, he's a young guy. And so, listen, I want to remind you to fan into, the, into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands for God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind or self-control. This is what we need to do with our young people, is to constantly remind them, rehearse to them why we're giving them what we have, how important it is for them to treasure them. Don't assume they know. Don't assume they remember. Don't assume. But as, and it takes work to constantly drill into them what they need to know, how they need to respond, what they need to hold to, to make sure that they're moving in the right direction. Someone said the best measure of a leader are the leaders that they leave behind. And that's challenging, isn't it? That is challenging for all of us, not only as pastors, but who are in a leadership Position. And I want to close with this now. Some guidelines to how we can authorize this next generation, what we need to do to empower them and, to, and, to, and to, to build them to a point where they want to hold on to that treasure, that they want to guard that treasure. Number one, we need to affirm their faith. Affirm the faith that they have that we're transferring to them. And Paul, as he says to Timothy in verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. See, what Paul was doing to Timothy was constantly reminding him about what was passed on from his grandmother to his mother to himself Basically, his identity. Remember, Pastor Lee opened up with identity? He opened up with that. That's what Paul was talking to Timothy about. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget what, what was birthed in you. That's your identity in Christ. And when a young leader or a young disciple recognizes their identity, it helps them when they face challenges. When the devil comes and assaults them, they remember, that's right, I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm the head, not the tail. I'm the one that's right, on the right track. They're the ones that, is off, that are off. 
And that's what Paul was trying to encourage Timothy about. That's what we need to do to those leaders, to our children, to those that we're working with. Continue to remind them, hey, this is who you are. And so we are just merely instruments in the hands of God as, as older Christians, whatever that age means to you as older Christians, to make sure we constantly affirm those who are coming up and remind them. You know, in the world, uh, people that aren't saved, when a kid is doing wrong, a child is doing wrong, you know, you're just like your, your uncle. You're just like your cousin. They were bums. You're going to be a bum. <laughs> they're not affirming them. They're, they're not building them up. They're tearing them down. You'll never amount to anything. You know, why can't you be like this or the other. So we can't do that. We have to find the gold in each young adult. Find the treasure that, that they have, you know, and begin to work with it and begin to develop it. And then acknowledge, acknowledge their gifting. Not only affirm their faith, but acknowledge the gift in them. Search for it. It's going to take work as, as, as Pastor Lee was digging, you know. A lot, of, a lot of times, those new disciples are filthy, they're dirty, aren't they? They got a lot of crud on them. And we as leaders, we need to, to, to work with them and uh, acknowledge, look, it must be in there somewhere. There's a gift in there somewhere. It's like that story of a young boy that he was promised a horse and two kids were promised a horse and, you know, one kid went, to, went for, for Christmas and he went uh, to his backyard and he didn't find, he just found a bike. He saw a lot of, uh, you know, just nothing, to, nothing there and he didn't want to bother, so he was disappointed. The other kid went to, to the backyard and what he saw was a gigantic pile of manure. And what was his mindset? There's got to be a horse in here somewhere. <laughs> and so he started digging. And that's what we got to do. That's what we have to do. We have to dig in that crud and begin to look for the gifting in those young people. And that leadership is not going to be recognized unless we encourage them to use the gifts that God has given to them. <clears throat> you know, um, I'll leave that alone. Uh, I, won't, I won't go there. I'll just move on. And then live it out. Um, this is the last time. Live it out. You know, as, as leaders, what we need to do is Paul recognized the importance uh, of uh, the role model aspect. That what we need to do as leaders is, is set that example for them and teach those young adults, uh, the next generation. You know, you're not just given a position of authority, but people are going to be watching you. They're going to be watching how you handle what you've been given. They're going to see what you do with it. Are you going to make it all about you? You look at me now. I got a little bit of authority. How are you going to handle this? And so what we need to teach them is learn to respect what God has given to you. Because when you learn to respect what God has given to you, people will respect you. That's the way it works. Philippians 3.17. Join, Paul says, with others... And following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern, the pattern, the standard, the guidelines we gave you. This morning, so, so critical, this simple word, authorize, authorization, that when we, 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 we implement that into our lives as leaders, as pastors, that church growth will begin to develop. We do it with wisdom. We do it in, 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 in um, levels of authority. But we don't stop doing it. We continue to do it. And we will see our churches reach their potential. We'll, we'll see those ministries begin to develop. If you want your ministry to grow, start, start developing leaders. Don't do it all yourself. You want to reach your potential in that ministry? Let somebody else start to raise up and reach their potential. As we bow our heads for a few moments, close our eyes. This morning, um, 
What I want to do is, is, is send you out back into your city, your areas of ministry, wherever that is. And so much has, has been poured into us this week. And this morning what I want to do is allow the Holy Spirit to seal that, to confirm those things that you've heard. That you would not just walk out of here with a couple of days and, and nights of, of preaching, but with life. Life standards that you can apply to yourself. So that you, not only as individuals, can reach your potential, but the church you belong to will grow into what God wants it to be. So I want you to think to yourself, as a leader, if that's the case, as a pastor, what am I doing? Who am I preparing to authorize, to give authority to? Who am I training? Who am I investing in? Who am I pouring into? Because if you're not, then forgive me for saying this, then you, you're a bad leader, according to God's word. And we know what the failure of doing that is. We read about it with Joshua. This morning, we have a responsibility as seasoned Christians to do our job. Take time, look around, and begin to dig for the gold in people's lives, their giftings. Think about your church, your ministry. Then I want us to stand right now. And what I want us to do is I want us to make a commitment. I want us to seal this right now, right here, is to make a commitment before God and your brothers and sisters and say, I vow right now that within six months of today that I will have already raised someone up to replace myself or I will be working on replacing myself because that's how multiplication takes place and that's how people reach their potential that's how you got where you're at because someone developed you and invested in you and caused you to raise up to another level in your faith and your your belief in what God has for you so I want you to Repeat this with me, if you would, as we close our eyes for a few moments. And just say this here today. In Jesus' name, I make this commitment before you, God, and my brothers and sisters. I will be determined to invest in somebody else to raise them up to replace me so that they can do the very same in others I make this commitment because I want to see people reach their potential and I want to see my life reach my potential and it will not happen until I authorize other people to have power in their lives. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for this time in my life. Amen and amen. I want you to start worshiping God. I want you to start praising the Lord right now. Hallelujah.
Glory, 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 glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Father God, you heard our cry. Build your church, oh God. Raise up the army of men and women, leaders, God. Leaders to lead the generations that are to follow, to accomplish your will, your purpose for this fellowship and ministry, that your name would be lifted above every name. You would be exalted, God, above every name. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on, why don't we sing a song this morning? You got one? Come on, sing it out. Praise God. All right, here we go. Lord. Praise God. Well, I really believe. I really believe what we prayed right now is going to happen. You believe that? Yeah. Amen. It's going to take digging, determination, but I tell you what, it's going to happen. We're going to have a good time. Amen. In the coming months here at the New Harvest Ministry. Praise God. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this is the end of our summit today. Thank you so very much each and every one of you, all the workers once again, all those who helped during the week, everyone who came. God bless you all. We so, so appreciate you.